Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jeremy Kahn. Um, and the title of this talk is 60 Frames Per Second or Bust, Bleeding Edge Web Animation. So this is going to be kind of a zero to 60 talk to make kind of a bad pun. Uh, whereas we're, we're going to talk about like everything from the basics all the way up to the more advanced stuff. And uh, my, my goal at this talk is to kind of um, reframe how we look at animation on the web and how we approach doing it. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself again. Uh, hello again. My name is Jeremy Kahn. I'm a Frameworks developer at a company called Jellyvision in Chicago. Jellyvision is, Jellyvision is an interactive uh, company that communicates via interactive conversations. We do some really cool stuff, so check us out. Um, when I'm not doing uh, stuff in my day job, I spend a lot of time making open source stuff on putting on GitHub uh, and sharing my thoughts on Twitter, both as Jeremy C. Kahn in both places. Um, I want to highlight this bottom part here in that I am not an animator. I am an engineer, so why am I here talking to you guys about animation, which is a creative thing that you know I you wouldn't want wouldn't want to let me near any you wouldn't want to let me near any place close to you know uh, design tools because that's just it's, it's not going to work out well. But I think that you know the intersection of art and science, as it's commonly referred to, you get something really magical there. Um, I think when you get people who are really good at design and you put them with people who are really good at like, finding the science behind things, you can just get the best results. So I like to focus on the science side of things, the engineering components, and let the, uh, the creatives focus on the art stuff. And it's a pretty good team. I find animation interesting because it's a really powerful communication tool. I think that um, animation helps us connect the dots, and that's kind of how our brains work as humans. Um, static images are, are, are pretty good and text is okay, but when we see, th see things move, we can make sort of like a, an intrinsic connection with it. We can really understand what it's trying to communi communicate to us, so it's important to get this kind of thing right. So I've got this talk uh, you know, organized into three sections, methodology, APIs, and tooling, but let's take a look at methodology first. Now, this is not an official um, way of, uh, of looking at things. This is just how I've kind of come to see it. But there's predefined and algorithmic animations. Um, and algorithmic animations kind of deal with not knowing necessarily what the next frame of the animation is going to be. It's, it can be unpredictable. So uh, it basically just, every frame just takes a bunch of input variables and um, then renders those to the screen. And you don't necessarily know what those input variables are going to be because those could come from... Uh, user input or network activity or any number of things. So this example, this is like you know kinematics, like physics, and you know just responding to um, the, the changing state of an in, of a simulated environment, or reactivity, where again where it deals with like responding to events of some kind, such as user input. So that would be more of like uh, more like a game. So vi video games would be more like algorithmic algorithmic animations. Predefined animations, I think, are a little bit easier, uh, and that's where you can, you can mathematically determine what the entire state of the animation is from any given point. Uh, and this is probably pretty familiar to people who, are, you know, who might come from a flash background. Uh, so tweening is just a way of defining a singular motion just from start to end with an easing formula. And keyframes are, are little more than just sequential tweens, so a, a tween that begins as soon as the last one completed. And one little, piece, one little last piece of methodology is uh, easing. And that's, uh, easing's important because nothing in reality works, no, nothing in reality moves at a linear uh, rate of speed. There's always some sort of acceleration and deceleration, sometimes intermixed, but it's not, you know, it, it's not perfectly smooth all the way across. Uh, there's a lot of easing formulas out there. Uh, these, uh, this is just a screenshot of uh, easings.net, which is a useful resource for this sort of thing. There's no limit to the types of easing curves you can have, but there's a, a set of common curves that are that were many of which were developed by uh, Robert Penner, who is a, who was an Adobe engineer, and now he's doing other stuff. Um, but you'll know them if you see them because they're all over the web. They're, they've become more or less standardized. So that's methodology. Let's look at how we can actually use code to make this stuff real. Let's take a look at CSS. So CSS really just gives us two APIs for, for make, making things move in the web, transitions and animations. Uh, there's nothing new here, but it's kind of interesting to look at how these really um, you know, work together. 
Um, I see transitions as being this reactive approach to animating things and animations being active, meaning that transitions, um, they respond to a change in state in the DOM, but animations create that change in the state. So I've got a few uh, simple examples for anybody who might not be familiar with them, but let's... Uh... So here's a simple transition. When I mouse over this, it just flips around. It's really simple, and there's no JavaScript running on this page. But the way this works is that we have, um, we have an H1 and a span, and uh, we have this hover class for the span that just changes the, uh, flips it around and changes the color. Uh, and the magic part here is this line, the transition, which basically says, for any property that changes, just animate that, th th that state change. So this is a simple way of just getting hover effects or class changes or just you know, um, making things move without having to have a whole lot of uh, JavaScript infrastructure to make it happen. Uh, and the other um, type of animation that CSS gives us is animations, so, or in other words, keyframes. And this is more of the active thing that I was referring to. So here's another Hello World thing, and it's just cycling its colors, nothing too crazy, but the thing is, is that I didn't have to interact with it. Um, it just kind of goes. Uh, and to look at the syntax for this thing, uh, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you. Um, unfortunately, there's, a, there's repetition here because um, uh, this spec is still not totally standardized, so everybody's got their own vendor prefix version of it. So I, at the moment, you have to re redefine the animation twice and set it up twice. But as we can see here, once we actually get to the meat of what this is doing, it's just defining some keyframe states and then looping through it. So again, nothing too crazy, but I, I didn't have to do anything to make this animation occur. So that's CSS, pretty simple stuff. Uh, JavaScript is a little bit different. Um, whereas CSS gives us declarative ways to create animations, with JavaScript it's a lot more imperative. Um, and to understand what that means, you have to kind of take a step back for a second. And what animation is, the, way that we, the reason that we see motion is because it's showing us a bunch of different frames really quickly, making the, uh, the illusion of motion. Um, and Historically, that, that's done by scheduling you know, a frame to be rendered at some point in the future, many, many times, very quickly. Uh, and that's what we have to do with JavaScript. Uh, and the way we schedule those frames is a set timeout traditionally, or newer browsers give us a request animation frame. Uh, a set timeout is nice because it works literally everywhere. It's, it's native to the language. Um, request animation frame isn't available in older browsers. Um, but the key difference is that with set timeout, you can define when you want the, when, when you want the callback function to execute, or at least request it because it's not perfect, whereas request animation frame uh, takes care of the timing for you. The assumption by the browser is that um, you are using this callback inside of your request animation frame to render something to the screen with an animation, hence the name. So it optimizes to have that happen 60 times a second because that's when things look really smooth. Uh, the browser optimizes this for its, for its rendering pipeline, as far as I can tell, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, there's other advantages to it, such as I, I think when you um, switch tabs, it like, goes back to like one second uh, uh, timeouts. Um, but generally, in most cases, request animation frame is the preferred way to schedule a function to be called for rendering stuff to the screen. So, we have CSS and we have JavaScript. Which one's better? You know, like clearly one must be better than the other. We want to use one and not the other. But I don't really think that this is the case. I think that these two languages, languages work better together than they do apart. I think that CSS loves JavaScript. She get married. <laughs> um, and when I say that, you know, these languages work better together, that's because you can have hybrid solutions. Uh, because they each have strengths. CSS you know, it's understood by the browser, so the browser can, 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 can you know, literally and theoretically do things to optimize a CSS, CSS, optimization, or CSS animation. Uh, JavaScript might not be as optimizable in some cases, but it is more flexible. So we can kind of get the, of, the best of both of these worlds. The easiest way to do this is to trigger CSS transitions with JavaScript. Now, as I mentioned before, transitions just respond to a change in state. I showed you an example where I hovered over the element and it flipped around. But you could do a lot of things with this. You could add an inline state 
or an inline style to change the state. You could uh, add a class, which has, has a similar effect. And this is actually pretty powerful. So I've got another example here, how this works. So another really simple Hello World example. Uh, now I've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And on this uh, CSS, I've just got the H1 and the Grow class. But we can see that the Grow class isn't on here, but I'm actually adding it with JavaScript here. So nothing too crazy, but the point is, is that I'm controlling how this animation with JavaScript. I could add any, add any class, and it would change the state however I want. Um, I don't have to do any JavaScript logic to handle animation or a, or, or a run loop or anything like that. The browser handles it for me, um, so it's super convenient. Uh, it's a great way of kind of separating you know, uh, your state logic from your actual um, uh, from your view from your view layer, and this is also really great because it's got an excellent graceful degradation uh, kind of pattern, um, meaning that if I ran this in a browser that did not support CSS transitions, uh, the user would just see both states, which for most things is probably okay. Uh, for something like this, it's kind of more of a um, a uh, it, it just kind of enhances the experience. It's not the content in and of itself. If you need a certain animation that is critical to your experience, this wouldn't work. But in most cases, animations are more enhancements rather than core functionality, typically. So a more advanced approach is to create CSS animations with JavaScript. There's a couple, a couple of ways to do this. And I don't see many people actually using this in the real world, either because it maybe doesn't work, which I haven't heard anything because I just haven't seen much feedback on it. Um, or because people just don't know about it. But there's, uh, so when, when I showed you the CSS uh, animation example, there was, uh, uh, there, there, there were, it was just a bunch of keyframes. And there's no limit to the amount of keyframes you can have in a CSS animation. Um, and you, there's nothing d dictating that it has to be hard coded into your, into your, uh, into your style sheet. So you could use JavaScript, for example, to create a whole bunch of style rules, or you could use a CSS object model to, um, to, to create it through a more pure approach. Uh, James Long, who's another speaker here, has a great project, I believe it's called CSS Animations, um, but it's on GitHub, and it, it takes the CSS object model approach, but there's also other ways to do it, um, where you just create this giant string of uh, CSS text and inject it into the DOM. I've got a little blog post here that explains it in more detail, but I've got an example so we can just kind of see how it looks. Actually, I think I've got this open in Chrome where it's easier to see anyways. Here we go. So I'm, this is using a library that I wrote called Recapy, uh, and this is just for demonstration purposes, just to show how it works, but we have, a, we have three buttons up here, one for stopping the animation and one for running it in JavaScript and in CSS. So here it is in, in JavaScript, nothing too crazy. And here's the exact same thing in CSS. And it looks the same, which is kind of the point. But the idea here is that the JavaScript approach uh, is doing inline style changes. Uh, it's a source map. Um, but with the CSS, we're actually creating a style element and injecting into the DOM. So if we take a look at the head, what Recapy is doing, and which is what this, th this approach is all about, is creating a giant CSS string and inject injecting it into the DOM. And it's pretty long, um, but it seems to work pretty well. And you can't really see a, a, much of a difference in performance on a machine like this, because this is reasonably quick. But um, you can see a big difference on mobile browsers. When I look at this on my iPhone, it looks way smoother when I'm, when I'm rendering it via CSS. Um, so. What, go, what happens when I remove, or, or when I stop this animation, is that it just removes that style element. So it's kind of a cool trick. Um, it wouldn't work everywhere. Uh, big caveat to this approach is that it can take some time to render the giant CSS string. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind, especially if it's for a more intricate or longer animation. It may not be appropriate, but if there's, certain, uh, if there's a certain animation uh, or, or, or motion that uh, the CSS spec doesn't really facilitate easily natively, you can create that animation with JavaScript and then more or less export that to CSS for better rendering. So let's dive into performance for a second. 
And I can only kind of get into the high-level details of this because it's a really wide subject. And it can really, it, it could span its own talk, or it can, in fact, even span its own conference, and it, it does actually. Uh, I think there's a few conferences that are all about you know, web performance. So I'm just going to cover the high-level details for, for right now. So the goal with animations always is to hit 60 frames per second. Uh, this is more or less the limit of what the human eye can perceive as perfect motion. Uh, we can't really see anything beyond 60 frames per second, but a lot of people can start to see degradation of, uh, of the motion um, when you start getting below that, like 50 or 40, and you can definitely see a difference at 30 or below. So we want to hit 60 frames per second as much as we possibly can. Rachel Neighbors has a great quote on this. Uh, she is a, um, a, an animator turned web developer. Now she just kind of does both, like web animation um, like for various interactive things. Uh, and she says that jank kills the precious illusion of life. And this is from her recent Alista Part article, which is really good, and I suggest you read it. It's a link which I'll share with you later. Um, but this is, this is why animation is important, is because we kind of relate to it because, you know, as I had mentioned, we, 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 we kind of connect dots. That's how our brains work. And when there is, you know, sluggishness or choppiness in that motion, it kind of, it, it breaks our, 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 our suspension of disbelief. It, it, it ruins the experience. And there's a huge movement in the community right now to try and, you know, to get rid of jank. Um, this is the, the, the term for it. It basically just means, you know, dropping of frames sluggishness. The best thing that we can do right now as web developers is to leverage the GPU. This is something that's relatively new uh, to, to us as web developers. Um, it's only newer APIs that allow us to do this. Um, so now that it's here, we should start taking advantage of it as much as we possibly can. And using the GPU is important because it's just better for rendering things to the screen than the CPU is. Uh, that's what it's there for. That's why it was created, to you know, put stuff on the screen. So let's use our computer's components for what they're meant to do. Now, a lot of people like to use this hack where the, it, it just magically sends um, you know, animations over to the GPU to be rendered. And that is to put translate Z0 on something. And that what this does is it creates its own composite layer that um, then gets sent over to the browser and it just magically animates faster and everybody's happy. But unfortunately, I've got some bad news for you. It's not quite this simple. Um, this isn't something you really want to depend on, um, primarily because it's an implementation detail of some browsers, specifically Blink and WebKit. Um, and it's not standardized. And because it's an implementation detail, it's really just a byproduct of how the, 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 uh, how the browser happens to work. It could change at any time. So you don't want to just put translate Z0 and, and just move on and, and, and call it a day. It's not that simple. Uh, additionally, when you start putting everything on the GPU to, for, for rendering, um, you exhaust your video RAM, which there's not necessarily, necessarily a lot of, especially on mobile. So you have to pick and choose which things you want to GPU optimize whenever possible, um, and which ones you just want to like, let the browser handle it. The other big part of this is that um, you want to limit your GPU texture uploads. And this is where it gets kind of confusing. So the GPU is really fast for rendering things to the screen. The CPU, not so much. Uh, but the actual communication pipeline between the CPU and the GPU is relatively slow. So if we're spending a lot of time sending data from the CPU to the GPU, then we're going to lose many of the performance benefits of using the GPU to render stuff. So how can we get around this? We can, if we limit the types of properties we animate, we, we can avoid sending unnecessary data to the GPU. The way this works at a high level is that for the GPU to do anything, you have to render a bitmap and then send that bitmap data over to the GPU. Uh, but when you, when you animate opacity and transform, you don't have to re-render that, that bitmap. The browser can optimize for that. It just recomposites things in the, uh, for, for the GPU. So it sends much less data across the wire so the GPU can actually animate this stuff. 
So what this means is that um, if you're animating something where you're changing the height or the width or the background color, um, you can't GPU optimize that in any meaningful way. So uh, whenever possible, try and work your animations around so that you're only animating opacity and transform, and you'll get much better frame rates. Uh, this link actually down here uh, really helps to explain how this stuff works in great detail. Um, it's, it's an HTML5 Rocks article, and uh, definitely check this out a little bit later. So it's very complex, and I kind of just skimmed the surface of you know, performance when it comes to animation. But the important thing, thing to note here is that there's no one good way to do this, unfortunately. A lot of people just want one magical solution where they don't have to consider all of the, uh, you know, the subtle, uh, subtle details of the whole thing, but we're at a state where you can't just run with one solution and call it a day. You kind of have to play with it. Um, some animations work better with JavaScript, some animations work better with CSS. And it also depends on your operating system, your browser, your hardware, a lot of stuff. So don't just like, like dogmatically stick to one approach, CSS or JavaScript or one tool set. You just have to play with it on a case-by-case -case basis and you know, determine which patterns work for you. Also, there's other issues um, beyond just performance that you have to consider. Uh, like CSS is great for simpler animations or, or little UI enhancement interactions, but it totally falls apart for workflow type situations, meaning that you can't necessarily change where the playhead is in the timeline. And a lot of browsers have issues uh, with timing, so that if you have a bunch of CSS, like, a CSS animation with a bunch of divs, for instance, animating in a very specific way, uh, there's timing issues, so they don't actually line up correctly. Uh, Jack Doyle of GreenSock, um, GreenSock is a JavaScript animation and also a, a, a Flash animation tool. Um, he's done a ton of research on this. So if you go to greensock.com, he's got plenty of articles on how this stuff breaks down. Um, and it really is just a mixed bag. Some things CSS is better at, other things JavaScript is better at. Um, we're, it's kind of a weird state in the industry right now. So I suggest that, having, that you try and optimize to have one way of defining an animation and then determining whether you, you, whether you animate with CSS or JavaScript or you know, the implementation details of it. Just have one singular way of defining how an animation should work. Now this is my favorite part of this presentation and uh, we're going to talk about graphical editors. Uh, and graphical editors are interesting to me because I think that code is an incredibly ineffective animation tool. I think that when people want to animate a lot of things with code, we're just kind of looking at the problem wrong. And that's because using code to, ma to make an animation is like using poetry to draw a painting. It just doesn't make any sense. You don't want to describe how something should look. You want to manipulate and like visually directly manipulate how it's going to be. Um, so I think that we need to start looking more towards visual editors uh, and less at code for actually animating stuff. Code is how things get implemented, but it doesn't make sense to actually try and create animations in this way. Uh, this is something where, uh, like, we're, we're still trying to catch up to Flash with. Um, like, they, they, they cornered the market for years because they had an incredibly powerful tool, the Flash authoring environment, for creating animations, and it, and it made sense to designers. Designers are the ones who make animations, so we need to optimize for their skill sets. Fortunately, things are getting better uh, in this regard. Uh, there's actually a bunch more tools that I've got listed here. Uh, one recent tool that I found is called Animatron, which is a, uh, a free tool that kind of resembles Flash, the overall environment, um, and it's free. Um, I, I don't know how they're making money because it's not open source, but um, it's cool, so check it out. Uh, Edge is pretty cool because it, it's from Adobe, therefore they've kind of learned from their, own, from their own past. And I've got Flash on here because as of very recently, Flash can actually export its animations to HTML5 Canvas. So if you're used to a Flash workflow for creating animations, you don't have to give up the tool set that you know and love, if that's your thing. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and I've got another uh, tool on here, which is one that, that I wrote called Styly, and this is Kind of a, it's a different take on animation uh, because I, because I'm not an animator, I just want to put something on the screen and get it to move around. I wanted something just simpler to, to work with. So I'll just give you um, a quick demo of that. 
just running that locally here. Uh, but the idea is that it's just a tool for creating CSS keyframes. Uh, it's not a full animation suite. You just uh, add some keyframes, move them around. Then, uh, oops, maybe uh, change the, the CSS uh, 3D rotation of it a little bit. Oops, don't go back to my browser. So you can move it around, add an easing formula, because I said that's an important part of animations. Um, <clears throat> maybe make a custom easing formula so you can tweak the curve as you, as you need it. So it's just, this is meant to, uh, to just get something on the screen and, and, and just like get it working in a few minutes. The, uh, the original motivation for this is to create CSS animations. So if you click the CSS tab here, then you can see that it's creating all the CSS, which you could then copy and paste into a style sheet and have the exact same animation. So it's just a, it's a simpler way of doing what I thought was kind of painful because um, I do not like the CSS animation syntax, the keyframes, and I just wanted to get something on the screen and move it around. So to wrap things up, we've got methodology, you know, algorithmic and predefined animations with uh, uh, um, you know, tweaking and keyframing, APIs through CSS and JavaScript. Uh, so we have, this, we have declarative and imperative ways of doing things and tooling um, where, where we have more graphical tools. And I think that the tooling thing is really important because as I said, you know, the, the people who really make animations are designers. It's not to say that we can't make animations, but you know, we're developers and developers create, um, you know, engineering solutions to engineering problems. Um, that's not to say you couldn't be both, kind, you know, both of those people at the same time, but there's a difference in that skill set. Um, and I think it's really important also to have uh, good open source tools, because we had the problem with, with, with Adobe where they made this, this industry-leading, industry-defining tool, but it was locked away you know, in, on, their, on their machines. So I think it's important for the community to invest, for the community to invest in making open source either similar tools or competing tools or whatever, so that we can you know, make the, the industry-leading tool shared by all in a community effort. And that's animation in a nutshell. Uh, thank you.